I'm joined by Debbie Kennedy, the CEO of LifeSearch. Thank you for joining me today, Debbie. How are you? I'm good. Good to see you, Jeff. Good to see you too. Um, why don't we start? Uh, you've got a very, um, uh, I guess, experienced background uh, and also one that's, I guess, filled with a lot of um, great things that you've done in the UK and you've recently moved to LifeSearch. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and then I think also what LifeSearch is doing as well. Yeah, no, thanks. I, I don't know if experienced is shorthand for a very long career. No, it's, it's, um, a, it's definitely a positive, definitely a positive. It's a positive, good. Yep. Uh, but yes, I, I've been in financial services for well over 30 years, I'll put it that way. And But I've been fortunate enough to have quite a varied career. So I've worked with insurers, reinsurers, worked at an outsourcer and I've just joined LifeSearch which is one of the largest protection advisors in the UK. Um, we're, we're telephony based but also offer an online service as well and, and for me this this is a really great you know place to be because I think for a long time I've been edging closer and closer to where the customer is in our business of protection and, and so to land here now is, is a really great opportunity and, and maybe I'll, I'll come on to that. But it, it's the, I suppose in a way my, my career started and I won't take you through everything, but I started as an underwriter and, and it's maybe relevant because I, I had to learn how to assess information and how to assess risk and how to make decisions. And, and back in those days, we didn't have automated underwriting rules engines. So it's very much the, the view of, of the underwriter and how we took in information and, and almost your biases as well. So you, you may have seen some very bad claims with diabetics and, and really all, almost had an unconscious bias about that. Or your actuarial team might have been telling you how bad people you know, with, with alcohol and liver disease uh, were. And I, I almost became a bit fascinated with this ability to make decisions very early on in my career. And, and sometimes to make them at speed and also to make them sometimes with very little information. And I was then also really interested in the insurance side, how we used claims information to ultimately inform our underwriting, to inform our products, to inform the pricing that then fed back into our claims. So there, there is a cycle going on there about decision making that, that's been there throughout the, the decades. That's, that's great. I think and we, I, I, we will get onto the decision making bit for a start. I don't want to pick up something that's not necessarily the topic of today that I'm really interested in. And I asked this in some ways as kind of an outsider to the insurance industry because I spent so long in banking. You were working for an insurer and then you're working now in distribution and you've obviously worked for reinsurance. It was interesting that you said you're moving closer to the customer because I always find that quite odd because I would have always thought that insurers should be the one that are the closest to their customers. But maybe in your new role at LifeSearch, you feel almost closer and it sounds like the insurers perhaps almost at arm length away from the actual customer themselves yeah I and you know I it is my view and I, I'd hoped many years it, it it wouldn't be that but I I actually think it's the way our um, markets particularly in the UK but I've worked worked in the Australian market as well is intermediated and you often think you've got fantastic ideas as an insurer and you come up with some product innovation, but you, you, you can't get it to the customer, you know, yourself at times. And yes, insurers, and, and I've worked for them, had, had direct-to-consumer offerings, but that's a very particular customer cohort who's come directly to you, recognises your brand. And I think most customers are actually looking for insurance without necessarily knowing what company to go for and they're looking for guidance and they're often seeking advice. And what I've come to realize is that that intermediary, that person who's actually talking to the customer, guiding them, actually has a lot of discretion and influence about how they 
position the need for insurance what products they position the hierarchy of those needs and almost the um, you know to create the engagement so Jeff yeah I, I, I learned you know very early on that we think we own the customer but actually it's that almost first point where the customer is thinking about a need they have and they probably can't even articulate it yet that Truly, I think that's where the engagement happens. And that probably happens in distribution more than with the product manufacturers. Yeah, I, th I think it's a really good point. And um, I, as I mentioned, I came from banking and I probably came into insurance with quite a specific set of views based on my experience, especially in retail banking around changing engagement models. One of the things that I've learned over mm -hmm. time, in my opinion, has changed. And I feel like my opinion changes every day as I learn something new is, is that there is a lot of value in advisors and intermediaries being involved with the customer because not, not the buying process of insurance is complex, but actually the needs of different customers is complex. And so mm -hmm. having someone that can actually advise them on what they need is really important because I think a lot of people, and they, in the US, they talk about the protection gap a lot. I think a lot of people don't necessarily know what they need. They know they need insurance, but they don't know exactly what type of insurance they need to protect you know what part of their life or to protect their children or whatever it might be and so my view has changed a lot because i you know when i first came into insurance here in the us um i think haven life was pretty new at that point um and i was like oh there's mm -hmm. got to be a boon of of you know kind of direct to consumer but i don't think there will be because i actually see the genuine need for intermediaries and advisors in that relationship yeah, I, I agree. I think we've we've been waiting, you know, almost for the the boom, you know, for everyone to to easily purchase online, and and you can do it, but there is most definitely a need for that engagement and guidance and advice. And something you said there, Jeff, I I, I know a lot, hear a lot, and we say this a lot in our industry. A lot of people say, well, do you know, our problem is we've made the products too complicated. I'm not sure they are that complicated. I, I actually think customers, when they're explained to them, they get it because because you know what they 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 deal with other complicated decisions as well in in their life and and actually we've got a really young cohort that you know demographic that are, are all into cryptocurrency now and and almost a gamification of investment and they're quite comfortable you know in that space. I think our problem is it's just not engaging to them and and that's it they're not quite sure that's where they need to go to maybe address this need and and that need might be articulated into what happens if I lose my job what happens if my parent becomes ill what happens if my child becomes ill and they're not necessarily thinking about products and that that's unfortunately what we think in products I think you've I think you've nailed it I think it's there is a disconnect there between kind of, you know, the industry thinks of products and the consumers think of a need. And so then yeah. you've obviously got the people that, that sit in the middle, which provide that advice, which I guess is a big part of what Life Search does, right? Is that you're helping people, you know, correctly identify their needs and then match that up with the with a product or a service that they that they it's exactly that. And and you know, so to go back to that start that I almost feel now I've kind of ended up with maybe where. Where, where I've wanted to be because what, what we do at Life Search is we, um, we, we, we interact with customers who've maybe started an online journey with a price comparison website. And at that point, all they know is they, they've searched life insurance. It's thrown up one, one of the aggregators and they're probably doing on a, a price base at that point. They're just looking what could be the, the cheapest price. And what we know is if that if that's all that mattered, great, they would just sail through that process, but they don't. They they actually there is decision points in there that, that stops them from fulfilling it. They they're not sure about have the correct amount, did they select the right term? And are they in the right product? Because we do make them decide about what product they need to to move into and life search comes in at that point we we actually are able to speak to the customer do, do more of a general needs based 
analysis and, and then search the market for them um, and, and help them find the best solution for them. And, and so in a way, I think customers, they, they do online research, they then come offline, they, they're looking for some reassurance, some guidance, and actually they might try and go back online again to, to make the purchase. And, and for us, that that's we, we want to be able to sort of move with them as they go through that decision making. Yeah, and I think the, the idea of getting advice is important because it's not a it's not an insignificant financial decision. And, no. and I, you would know this better than I, but I'm assuming that once people choose a, a product or an insurer to work with, it's probably re- it's not that likely that they would change, especially life insurance. I think like auto and homeowners is a little bit different. That can be a bit more transactional. But on the life side, it, in my opinion, it appears to be a lot less transactional, right? And so that that first decision is quite important. It is. And, and unfortunately, it's probably down to a bit of inertia and lack of engagement. You know, they, they get that product. They, they just think, good, I'm covered. And, and maybe what, what's happened at that point is that, you know, they, they took critical illness. You know, so they, they think actually, um, you know, if, if, if the worst happens, I have a cancer or heart attack, I'll be covered. But actually, at their life stage, maybe the, the, the likelihood is that they'll get injured. And it won't be one of the, the big critical illnesses, but it will be something around potentially even mental health or a bad back or, you know, some other kind of injury that will stop them from working. And they're, they're in the wrong product. They think they've done something, but that, you know, they, they um, have not reviewed their, their circumstances. So that's where you know not only actually life search and other advisors can help but i think it's a real value of, of advice is almost making sure that they're helping the their customer review their needs right. as well um mm-hmm. they you know you, you have to do that as your circumstances change yeah agreed sorry that was a one question that ended up a lot longer but that's i think it's really i think there's a lot of people that still don't really understand like the total like the total needs and in insurance and especially what consumers want so it's good mm-hmm. that you feel like you're getting closer you mentioned a couple of times decision making so you know i think you and i both agree hence why we're both you know, talking about this that decision making is changing in the industry so i'm really curious to get your kind of perspective on how do you see changes in technology impacting the way probably both the industry like traditionally but also consumers make decisions yeah, it, I mean, that you know, probably keep slipping that in because it is, is huge interest. I, I, I think technology is is probably helping us make decisions by using data more more effectively. And 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 get yeah, that that maybe sort of sounds obvious, but what what I believe it's doing is that. Previously, you know, if I think back to my time in, in insurers, a lot of our decision making was actually um, driven by claims um, experience, lapse experience um, uh, as well, and, and things like distribution quality coming through. But we often would look at those data sets in isolation. I, I think what technology is allowing us to do now, um, Jeff, it's it's almost this connectivity between different data sources and, and outputs. So we, we may have, you know, had maybe quite a backward looking approach to experience analysis, but where I've started to see it become quite powerful is when you're also overlaying that with some predictive analysis um, as well on it and I, I think technology is allowing you to join up join up those dots but bring information external data sources into probably your traditional data sources and, and probably without getting you know into all the depths of technology I mean I think for me one, one of the best you know the the game changers is is probably API strategies and and microservices because that that is truly enabling you to to bring in different data sources join up data share it in different ways and I know we talk a lot now about data architecture and data fabric, but it, it's actually just opening up now, allowing you to see 
I always think of patterns in data, but see them in different ways and make them usable for, for the layperson um, as well. If I look back at my time, you know, 30 years plus, I, I think we've gone from very sort of static data and then almost point in time decision making that, that was, is right for that moment in time to technology allowing you to uh, hypothesize, scenario based and be future, you know, be forecasting as well. Maybe that's the biggest shift I've seen in the use of technology. No, I, I would agree. I think one of the things that, you know, we're seeing, you know, as a, as a platform business is people really want to understand all the different nuances and scenarios that could actually happen yeah. in the future. And, you know, our view is, is and I'm you know, pretty sure you should the same, it's not like the data isn't available. It's not like there's tens of billions of data points of things mm. that have happened in the past that are very good predictors of what's actually going to happen in the yeah. future. So despite a changing demographic, people are still kind of acting in a fairly similar way. And so using that to actually be able to predict policyholder behavior, we think is really important as well. And especially what I know that we've spoken about this before, but the use of alternative data sources, we think is something is really valuable. Like we are, we're doing a lot of work with things like, you know, social determinants of health and looking at financial and demographic data to better understand policyholders and match that up with data. So I think an API first strategy is something that is going to become increasingly important. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, and, and that's why, you know, I, I do think APIs are, maybe they were what to me, the single <laughs> biggest step. I know, I know some real data scientists will, will have, you know, just, just almost the power of the models they're using now are a big step. But I think that's nothing if you can't actually join up sources of data and, and then make it, you know, available for yeah. us in, in finance and in, in insurance. Um, but you, I don't know, maybe, if it, you know, just, just to give you an example, because you sort of talked about the way we traditionally do things. And, that, and I mentioned I sort of, you know, started off as an underwriter. And, and interestingly, 30 years plus later, um, I will see very, a very similar underwriting approach in the market. Yes, actually, we've, we've built some automated underwriting rules engines. Um, but actually, they've been about for nearly 20 plus years and haven't really moved on. And we, we still absolutely need, you know, where, where, where there's too much complex disclosure, we, we still use underwriters, you know, that we, we have not got rid of the underwriter, they're still in every insurance company. And I, I look at that and, and I believe it's mainly because we're still asking the same questions. So even though we've automated some of the process, the questions that we're asking today will look remarkably similar oh. to probably what we were asking 30, 30 years ago. And, and what we really have never done is looked for alternative sources. And we're asking those questions because essentially we're thinking, we don't know what risk you are. We're going to ask you these questions. Mm. You might non-disclose to us because then we'll check them out as well. But what if we could find other proxies for, for that information, social demographic group, um, geomarkers, locations, may, maybe other attitudes to, to risk um, that, that we could overlay as well that, that would help us. And that's where I think, you know, as an industry, we've been quite slow to sort of look at those other sources of information and change the input that we're looking for from customers at the very start. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, kind of, you know that at Monto, we're big fans of the term decision science, which a lot of people take as there's no human involvement, but we have the perception that humans are very important in the decision-making process, so we're not trying to automate decisions making. I'm just curious, you know, you spoke about underwriting a little bit there, um, and you know more of an API led strategy. Are there in your experience in both you know distribution insurers, reinsurers, are there areas that you see in, in insurance uh, and like workflows or use cases or whatever you want to call them where you think taking a more decision science based approach will deliver the most value? I'm just curious if you've got a like a, an area where you're like this is 
maybe it's underwriting, maybe it's claims, maybe it's distribution. Like where do you think a huge amount of value could be taken by, you know, yeah. areas taking a more scientific approach to decision-making? I think one use case actually that I'm, I'm working on and, and interestingly, I've probably carried it over from being a, an insurer now into distribution is actually about distribution quality. Because what, one of the things I think we know is that you, you absolutely um, can influence the quality of disclosures in that sales process. And, and that ultimately has an impact on, on your claims experience, but also your persistency, your, you know, your lapses. If you, if you have not, you know, engaged the customer in the right way, you, you've not, you know, not enabled them to get the right cover. And what happens at the moment is particularly in reinsurance, you know, they're, they're trying to really understand the impact of that distribution quality um, because that will ultimately influence their risk rates. And then they, they overlay that with the insurer as well in terms of their processes, again, the quality of their questions, their product, their, their own underwriting. So for me, Jeff, I think there is a, a use case that I'm looking at that's almost saying, how could, you know, if I take LiveSearch, we at LiveSearch be really clear about saying, these are the customers we we're able to engage with. They look like this and we know that they respond best to this type of product. Um, you know, this is their style of engagement. You know, we, we, we ask the questions in this way, our quality and disclosures look like this. And, and I think then insurers can actually have a conversation with a reinsurer that says, we actually have some real line of sight right the way down that value chain to that first engagement and, and you know we can improve and control that and ultimately it's going to be better outcomes for all of us and and that leads to then better pricing better margins better better profit so this is something I'm keen to do that we join up all of those uh, almost you know sort of players in that value chain and we're much more, um, I think, in alignment with each other. There's almost, we take out some unknowns, you know, you know well, you were selling for this insurer, but we're not quite sure about the distribution that they go for, the, the quality of the leads they have. Actually, we take away those unknowns and, and we really help, you know, with that whole analysis of experience and pricing, um, et cetera. You know, and I assume, you know, if you look at distribution as a key, I guess, you know, use case of using decision science to improve, you know, efficiency, it's probably going to take a lot of friction out of the process for customers as well, right? Oh, I think it absolutely is. Because I said, what, what we've got is we, we've got a process today and, and certainly in the UK and I know other markets in the States uh, in Australia where we're building in checks because ultimately we don't trust the customer. They disclose to us and we make them disclose a lot of information, 30, 40, you know, uh, questions on an application form. Then we may check with their doctor, then we may get a blood test, then we may get an examination. Um, if we can truly sort of join up, you know, that sort of virtuous cycle and say, actually, we, we're talking to the right customers. We only ask them the most appropriate questions that we know are going to be important to that customer, you know, but based on age, need, et cetera. We get very good disclosures. I think we'll see a much more streamlined onboarding buying process come as, as a result of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's get better for everyone. So then um, kind of going back to, a, you know, we've discussed APIs and um, kind of data engineering and data strategy. Um, I'm not trying to answer the question before I ask it, but how do you think traditional approaches to using data or, you know, existing or third party data get in the way of insurers or, you know, distribution taking a more of a decision science approach? Yeah, so at the moment, I, I, I think it's very fragmented. 
um, the way the way we analyze it. And, and I said we we may be looking at you know some valuation data from from one set of actuaries and then also maybe pri uh, the pricing model is telling us something different and actually our underwriters have a completely different view as well and so if you you go through if you like all the functions in an insurance company you you will maybe find sort of di different slightly different views and frictions as you say within that that data you then have your reinsurer in the UK we we you know off later our insurer you know some cases 90 percent, some cases 100 percent of the risk they're using their data sets and often that's a difference between you know big numbers and they have a different view so you get all that and I then think where where data science comes in is is almost to the only way I can describe it is to take out a lot of the noise in all those separate data sets and silos that, that you're looking at and find a way to just create that line of sight. It's probably the best way to, to describe it right through to saying live search is typically attracting these type of customers that live in this area, this social demographic usually like to you know purchase this type of product this level you know motivated to do that aren't necessarily going to be anti-selective you know they, they they ask questions in this way and I think go back to what I was saying I, I think what decision science is doing is almost trying to start with that in mind and then use that to sort of I suppose test some of the assumptions that are coming out from the actual experience from the insurers and from the reinsurers and and to and that enable them to do some modeling with that information overlaid take out the noise um, that's in a lot of that process and a lot of the assumptions that that get made in the process as well i think that's where decision science and maybe I don't know if it was, you know, very deliberate, but it is a science. It should be seen. Decision making should be seen as a science. And, and I think that that's what we've got to get to. Yeah, I mean, we, we obviously agree, clearly. Um, yeah, yeah. And we think decision making absolutely should be a science and all the all the tools all the data, all the information is there as it exists today. Mm -hmm. It's just that most organizations are not doing it efficiently and effectively. And I think you mentioned the word silos and I think breaking down some of those silos is really important, especially, I, we even still see it today in the work that we do with some of our customers. There's still a, and I know that they're not the same skills, but there's still a like a, a wall between what the actuaries are doing and what the data science teams are doing. Um, yes. And, you know, in our opinion, decision science incorporates both of those disciplines. You can't have, one without the other and both are really important in understanding more about your more about your customers i, I recognize that as well jeff it's it's those organizational boundaries that that we have and then you you can not only do you have the insurer's own boundaries internal boundaries but then you put a reinsurer into the mix as well and then both of them have got to try and have a view on their distribution channel and, and I think that's, that's where it gets difficult. And yeah, how, how good could that be if actually yeah, yeah. you find a way so, so to join, it, join that up? Yeah, it almost sounds as though culturally and organizationally, there's probably a lot that has to change for people to really adopt decision science as a way of, you know, as a way of putting the science into decision making, no, no pun intended. Um, because we do see that as a barrier. I'm sure you've probably seen that in your own time as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you see a need in for consumers to have almost like point in time life insurance needs? I do. I, I think there is, um, it, it almost goes back to this understand instead of getting into a product and then you stay in that product, it's almost you, 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 you say, look, I'm, 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 I'm kind of, I've got a amount of cover, but actually at some point I might dial up 
my um my cover if I was if I was ill and then and then you dial that back down and you dial up the you know well what if I have critical illness um now that might be more and so you almost take out the the need to end up in an actual a product and 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 risk being in the wrong product as well yeah I mean I I I as both a consumer and I guess someone that's in the industry, I do agree. I remember I spoke at a conference, it was a few years ago now when there was more conferences around. And I, I think insurance should be a service, not a product, Yeah. honestly. And so, and I don't necessarily mean the way that it's served to consumers. I mean, people's needs change over time. Yeah. Sometimes daily, sometimes weekly, what, you know, the, some of the, the use cases that you mentioned. And so for people to have the ability to, change their insurance needs and coverage i think is something that could be really important and i guess your point on that i don't know i'm just curious is your point on that this is where you think decision science could be really useful yes because i i think there is um in this case decision science is almost you you're almost trying to use it to I suppose predict, you know, what are those life events? When, 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 when can you, you, you help the customer make a change? What, what's appropriate? What, 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 what do you, you know, do, do you sort of help push towards them? And what customers do, do you do that for as well? You know, I like, I really like that idea. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that as an extension, but I think that's quite a clever way of thinking about it because you have got all this data. And the ability to run almost infinite scenarios on what customers yeah. might actually re require at a different point in time in their life. Well, that's that's very interesting. All right. Um, well, I think maybe we'll we'll call it there, Debbie. Thank you very yeah. much for um, for joining us. Um, and I'm very excited for what you're going to do at Life Search.